Good day. Wherever you are and whenever you are, I greet you digitally. I'm Professor Charlie Rose, and this is Practice Ready Evidence, one in a series of presentations dealing with specific evidentiary issues and pieces of doctrine. And today I want to talk with you about privileges, privileges as they relate to the federal rules of evidence. And this is an interesting rule to talk about because there are a lot of misconceptions within the public and even within the practicing lawyers about how privileges work, what they do, and what they don't do. So let's get started. You know, if we go and look at Federal Rule of Evidence 501, uh, it tells us that the common law of the United States governs claims of privilege uh, in federal court, except for the United States Constitution, you should think Fifth Amendment, privilege against self-incrimination, uh, specific federal statutes that are designed to provide us with an additional privilege, or um, rules prescribed by the Supreme Court. Those would be the federal rules of evidence. And then the rule tells us as a beginning standpoint that in a civil case, if the cause of action arises out of state law, then the state rules concerning privilege will be applied in the decision. So you've got a lot of different things going on here. You've got uh, a statement that the constitutional right applies. You have the ability of Congress to create privilege by statute, signed by the president or overridden by uh, a supermajority. You've got the rules prescribed by the Supreme Court, which is this is actually a part of. And then you have an acknowledgment that in those cases when we're dealing with civil law, what we're going to do if it's a state cause of action that's in federal court on a jurisdiction issue, we're going to apply state privilege law. Which means that wherever you practice, you have to understand both the federal rules of evidence and the state rules of evidence. Uh, for example, I teach down here in Florida, and in Florida we have an extended set of privilege rules to, to include things like the accountant client privilege rules. You don't see that uh, in most jurisdictions. And now if we step back from it for a minute and we really look at it and we think about privileges conceptually, what we come to realize is that the federal rules of evidence are kind of a one-off. They don't actually capture and encapsulate the actual application of privilege in most states. They're an anomaly. Why is that? Because when the federal rules of evidence were first passed, uh, there was a little thing called Watergate going on. And there was a pending issue of executive privilege. And the Congress did not want to do anything that might inadvertently create protections for any of the individuals who were involved in the Watergate scandal. And so what they did was they dropped back uh, to some fundamental uh, statements, common law, state law applies when it's a state cause of action, and then the other thing they did was look at attorney-client privilege because that was one that they felt like they could relatively effectively define for us. Now, when I talk about attorney-client privilege, what I'm talking about uh, is flowing out of a Supreme Court case, Upjohn Company v. United States. It's a 1981 case uh, decided uh, by Rehnquist, if I remember right. And there does exist in the federal jurisdiction attorney-client privilege. But attorney-client privilege is a testimonial rule. What do I mean by that? I mean that you cannot be forced as the lawyer to testify against your client, and your client holds the right to assert that privilege. You can't waive it. The client has to waive it. That is a evidentiary rule of admissibility substantively at trial. It's completely separate from attorney work product and client confidentiality. Client confidentiality is a rule of professional conduct, and that rule governs when you may or may not disclose information. For example, in Florida, you, you have to disclose information if your client has told you that they're going to commit a crime uh, and you have reason to believe that that is a true statement. You have a duty to disclose when it's a pending potential injury to someone. Uh, that means that you have to tell somebody. It does not mean, however, that you could be called into court and be forced to testify against your client. Because the right of confidentiality is to tell anyone 
The attorney-client privilege is testimonial in nature, and it applies specifically when we're dealing with in-court testimony. So I could have a waiver of confidentiality or a violation of client confidentiality and still have the assertion of the attorney-client privilege at trial. And that's something that folks don't always understand. The other thing to think about really is attorney uh, client, uh, from attorney-client privilege perspective, is work product uh, and, you know, disclosure when we didn't mean to disclose. Uh, lawyers often send things that they shouldn't send. And in this age of digital media, that is even more common than it used to be. You know, you'll get an email that came with, to the, that went to the wrong person or that has an attachment that it should have not had attached to it. And this rule is looking at how waiver does or does not occur. Now, waiver means I've waived the right of uh, attorney-client privilege, I've waived the right of work product, and I've given you this information, maybe because it's, it's required in discovery or some other issue. The way we look at it is that when disclosure is made uh, in a federal proceeding, what is the scope of the waiver when I give it to a federal agency or someone else that I'm required to give to? And I waive that attorney-client privilege and I waive work product. That's sort of the setup for the way this rule works. And if we go and look at it, um, the waiver extends to undisclosed communication or information only if it was intentional and the disclosed or undisclosed information contains the same subject matter, and in order for them to be understood, they have to be considered together. Now, that's a limited category of waiver when we're dealing with waiver. And because it's a limited category, we have to understand that quite often, um, disclosure, inadvertent disclosure, does not uh, constitute waiver if I didn't mean to do it, I tried reasonably to prevent it from happening, and I took reasonable steps to rectify the error. And then it, it refers us to what, of course, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure uh, dealing with discovery. Why? Because Federal Rule of Evidence 502 is all about civil discovery and inadvertent disclosure in large cases from big law firms. Uh, it also applies uh, in criminal defense work and in prosecutorial work, but it really doesn't get the same kind of play unless you're dealing in a case that has so much information that data management becomes a problem. So I can have inadvertent disclosure. That does not waive the privilege. Um, what about if I'm doing it in a state proceeding? Uh, I, I, I'm in federal court as well, but I've given something up to the state. Disclosure to the state. Um, and it's not a state court order concerning waiver, it does not operate as waiver in the federal proceeding. Well, what does that mean? It means that I can disclose something in a state proceeding because it's advantageous to my client to do so. But I have not automatically also disclosed it for purposes of, uh, of a federal proceeding. Um, you just got to go and look at, is this the kind of waiver that would have been made under the rule? Uh, and is it a waiver or not a waiver under the state law that applies? Now, that's kind of a lot to digest from the standpoint of attorney work product and, um, and inadvertent discovery. But let's just step back from it for a moment and think about them for a moment. Attorney-client privilege deals with those things that your client told you that you now have a duty to keep confidential. Work product deals with the research that you do, the preparation for presentations that you are going to use on behalf of the client. And the way in which you put that together, because it derives from both your knowledge as a lawyer and the specific confidential information of the client, uh, is protected. And it's also protected because we aren't required to disclose our work product to the opposing side. Now, in the civil arena, lawyers hide behind attorney work product all the time uh, in an attempt to avoid disclosure. And that's why we've got this rule. And the rule goes through uh, the controlling effects of a court order and party agreements uh, and how this rule applies. It even references back to 101 and 1101 and that it's in state and federal and it's in arbitration, 
all these things are there. Um, and it applies even if state law is controlling in the jurisdiction. So what does this mean? It means that the federal courts are concerned with inadvertent disclosure. Uh, they are consumed with issues of discovery, particularly when it comes to electronically stored information. And, and this, this rule is trying to control that in a way that gives the judge control of the proceedings and lets them know what they do. Now, if you're a law student uh, and you're studying for the bar, Federal Rule of Evidence 502, it's an interesting thing, but you're not ever going to touch it. 501, on the other hand, is important to you. What's even more important are um, the other types of discovery. Now, I've got a slide up here, and, and you should really look at this slide. You'll notice that several of them have lines drawn through them. The reason that they have lines drawn through them is they don't actually exist in the federal system. There is no priest penitent privilege at the federal level. There is at the, uh, at the state level. Almost every state has a priest penitent or a priest clergy privilege. There is no journalist confidential source privilege. In fact, in response to the jurisprudence that says there's no such privilege, many states have created a journalist uh, confidential source privilege on their own or some other statutory law. There is also no physician-patient privilege when it comes to medical treatment. Uh, that's Whalen v. Roe. It's a Supreme Court case from 1977. You don't have a right to prevent a surgeon from disclosing information about you or a doctor from disclosing information about you at trial unless the doctor is a psychotherapist, a psychologist, or a psychiatrist who's providing treatment to you as a victim of, uh, of some sort of abuse. In that instance, you actually do. And that's uh, Jaffe v. Redmond, a Supreme Court case from 1996. And then there's the spousal privilege, which comes from Trammell v. United States. And I'm going to talk about the spousal privilege and the marital privilege at length. Why? Because it is the one that is, is commonly tested on, um, on most multi-state bar examinations. It's the one that lends itself to comparison between two standards. Uh, it can be slightly confusing, uh, and it's not just a black letter law test, so it comes up quite frequently. But I want you to remember, there is an attorney-client privilege, there's a psychotherapist-patient privilege, there's a spousal privilege, there's a marital privilege. There's four, right? But there are three that do not exist at the federal level. Priest, penitent, journalist, and physician patient. So it may exist in the state law. Uh, it may be, and in Florida we have most if not all of these, but it does not exist at the federal level. And if you're in a federal court dealing with federal issues, you're not going to be able to claim privilege under these particular rules. Um, husbands and wives, the spousal privilege and the marital privilege. Uh, we've got two privileges going on here. I've got two columns for you on the slide. The first one is spousal privilege, and then the second one is marital privilege. Spousal privilege deals with the specific relationship between you and your spouse uh, and the sanctity that's, that's associated with that. Marital privilege deals with the legal status of you being married and the rights that attach from it. Marital privilege is easy. It protects any communication that you intend to be private between you and your spouse that occur during the marriage, during the marriage. And this privilege survives divorce. Uh, it survives divorce, which means that uh, you have those private conversations, you talk with one another, anything that occurs there cannot be disclosed, even if you later get divorced. Uh, the privilege survives divorce. It applies in both civil and criminal cases, and both spouses are the holder of the privilege. That means either spouse can, as can assert the privilege and prevent the other from disclosing the information. Uh, it's, it's narrower in scope, but it's more powerful, and it's tied directly to the status of marriage. It is also the newer of the two privileges. The other privilege is the spousal privilege. The spousal privilege grew out of common law, uh, and it dates back 
prior to the founding of the nation. And the idea here is that communications between you uh, and your intended should be protected. And it protects communications you have with them both before and during the marriage. So anything that you might have talked about before the marriage is protected by the privilege. And anything you talk about during the marriage is protected. And it's sort of tied to this idea of the, of the sacrament of marriage, the idea that marriage is a sacred union uh, between two folks, uh, and it is, it is inviolate as long as it exists. However, the moment divorce occurs, the privilege is lost. The privilege is lost. Where was this uh, privilege applied? In criminal cases. And at the common law historically, whoever was on trial held the privilege and could assert it. Uh, so whoever was the defendant in a criminal case could prevent their spouse from testifying against them, as long as they were still married. Uh, and that was the common law for an extended period of time. The Trammell case that I mentioned earlier has sort of pushed it in the direction of the witness spouse holding the privilege. Well, what does this mean? It means if you commit a crime and you tell your wife about it and you disclose it, you need to make certain that she's happy with you when you go to jail so she doesn't decide to testify against you. Testify against you. Now, this is um, an interesting rule, the spousal privilege and the marital privilege, because I can fashion a question or an issue and test both rules at the same time. Uh, it often happens that both rules are applied at the same time. And the answer is different depending upon which lane you happen to be in. I've created this chart to kind of help you understand uh, spousal privilege versus marital privilege. If we look at the timeline before marriage, the only privilege that potentially applies is the spousal privilege. And we remember that it only applies in criminal cases. Uh, if we look at during the marriage, intended private communications are protected in both instances. And if we look at divorce, the privilege is lost if it's spousal, but it exists as to confidential communications made during the marriage after divorce if it's a marital communication. The rule is set up to protect those communications while at the same time allowing for the possibility of their disclosure if the witness spouse wishes to do so. Um, in a criminal proceeding under the spousal privilege, and if either side is willing to waive the communication in a marital privilege state, standpoint. This slide is useful to you. I throw it out there to you as something to consider because spousal privilege and attorney-client privilege are the most common topics that come up on the multi-state bar examination, and they're also what you tend to deal with quite a bit if you're involved in family law, if you're involved in the sort of civil disputes that are, that are marital in nature, you're going to have to understand this rule. And you need to understand it in conjunction with uh, attorney-client privilege, which is the other one that we've talked about at length. So from the standpoint of being proficient in practice and in a multi-state bar setting, what do we need to do? Um, we, need to, um, we need to think about how we are going to... Um, position ourselves from a presentation perspective. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean that um, we've got a checklist in our head. We think, um, one, what's my liability as the lawyer? Uh, does the attorney-client privilege apply to this communication that we've just had? How does that interact uh, with uh, the right of confidentiality of my client under the rules of professional conduct? And how do I need to protect my work product and my communications to ensure that I violate neither attorney-client privilege or inadvertently disclose uh, and, uh, and waive my client's confidentiality as to work product? We have to understand how those connect together because those are quite testable and those apply every day of our lives in practice. And then we need to understand spousal privilege and marital privilege as it relates to um, the type of work that we do. 
And then finally, we, we need to remember that an understanding of the state law privileges that govern whenever it's a question of state law are also available and applicable in federal court. If you see those things and you understand them properly, uh, you'll avoid the malpractice issue uh, and you'll be better, uh, better served to represent your client. And if you're a law student taking the multi-state bar exam, uh, at least you'll get those answers right. Uh, Till next time, I'm Charlie Rose and this is Practice Ready Evidence.